So we are moving right along through what we call the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. Today we are in Ecclesiastes. I was asked recently, you do know that's the most depressing book in the Bible. I'm well aware, I'm well aware, but it is, it's, a, it's worth our time to think about it, but I'm not gonna lie, that person was not wrong. <laughs> it's very depressing. Uh, but I think there is something in it for all of us, especially when you attach it to wisdom. So we're gonna start at the very beginning. Ecclesiastes 1, one through four. The words of the teacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, Vanity of vanities, says the teacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What do people gain from all the toil in which they toil under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. These are the first opening lines of Ecclesiastes. I'm going to tell you, it's a strong opener. It's almost, imagine the image of the pale blue dot. You ever heard that phrase? I think you probably know it. In 1990, right before Voyager 1 was about to shut off, it captures 60 last images of the universe. One of those images was this one. It's called the pale blue dot. I had to draw an arrow on it so you could see it because that little dot is smaller than one single pixel. And that little dot is planet Earth. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What do people gain from all the toil in which they toil under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the Earth remains forever. In other words, in this vast universe, you know, maybe even multiverse, you don't know, neither do I. What does it gain to work so hard? I mean, what's the point in working so hard? We are but a speck of dust. All of this effort, says Solomon, is vanity. Now, vanity, that's a loaded word throughout the book, and scholars can often substitute words because they have multiple meanings. Vanity can also mean meaninglessness or vapor. Meaninglessness of meaninglessness, says the teacher. Meaninglessness of meaninglessness. All is meaningless. Or vapor of vapors, says the teacher. Vapor of vapors, all is vapor. What do we gain from all the toil in which they toil under the sun? We gain nothing because it's all vapor. It's a pale blue dot. It is meaningless. All of this is vanity. It is just the background of something else going on in the universe. A generation comes, a generation goes, it's vapor, it's meaningless. King Solomon is saying everything. Now, definitely, essentially, he is saying it's meaningless. It's vapor, dust in the wind, mist, fleeting, minuscule, momentary, fading, this life, This effort, this job, this relationship, this time, this building, this worry, it's all vapor. I mean, do you realize what this means? It means you can spend all of your time and energy stacking your blocks nice and neat, but you don't get to decide what happens to those blocks when you die. And I hate to be the one to tell you this, you're going to die. And don't, you don't get to say what people do after you're gone. I mean, you can try to say what you want people to do with your blocks, but you're not around. You can't guarantee they're going to follow and that anyone's going to care because you're dust in the wind. Your stuff becomes vapor. Your wishes are meaningless. It's all vanity of vanities. I mean, Solomon sounds a lot like Freddie Mercury here and how he ends his song, Bohemian Rhapsody. Nothing really matters. Anyone can see. Nothing really matters. Nothing really matters to me. Well, that's our sermon for the day. So (laughs) 
That is the entire book of Ecclesiastes in a nutshell. Go in peace. It doesn't matter what you do. You're equivalent to Don Quixote chasing windmills. Have a great day. Put up the discipline of silence slide. We're out. I'm just kidding. I really don't want to leave you right here because it really is a depressing thought. And I have a little bit more to show you. We're only in the first four verses of an entire book. And as long as you keep going in Ecclesiastes, I'm going to warn you, it gets worse. Look at verses 12 through 14. I, the teacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I applied my mind to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. So he knows everything is meaningless. So if he can just attach meaning to something, maybe he can find some wisdom in it. We keep going. It is an unhappy business that God has given to humans to be busy with. I saw all the deeds that are done under the sun and see all is vanity and a chasing after wind. In other words, if all we're doing is meaningless, then I might as well learn as much as I can. I'll take on as much wisdom as I can. I will learn about the human condition as much as I can. Well, well, says Solomon, I did that. I saw the deeds that are done under the sun and see all is vanity, chasing after the wind. All is vapor. All right, it gets a little bit worse. Verses 16 to 18. I said to myself, says Solomon, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my mind has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my mind to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this also is but a chasing after wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation. And those who increase knowledge, increase sorrow. Great. Apparently, all the pursuit of wisdom does is just make you more aware of the sorrow and pain and agony that's in the world, and it just becomes more prevalent. I was once told by a church historian, I told him that I really envied the body of knowledge that he knew. It was such a helpful thing to know church history and all the history and moving pieces of Christianity. His response, I don't know, it makes the present day like watching a train wreck in slow motion and not having the power to stop it. All I do is watch humans and cultures and churches repeat past mistakes. My historian sounds a lot like King Solomon. More wisdom just means more awareness of sorrow. More wisdom means more awareness of pain. I mean, it's right here in verse 18. For in much wisdom is much vexation, and those who increase knowledge increase sorrow. Great. And it gets even worse. Chapter 2, verses 14 to 17. The wise have eyes in their head, but fools walk in darkness. Yet I perceived that the same fate befalls all of them. Then I said to myself, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said to myself that this also is vanity. For there is no enduring remembrance of the wise or of the fools. Seeing that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten. How can the wise just die just like fools. So I hated life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me for all is vanity chasing after the wind. So bad things happen to good people. Good things happen to bad people. We don't win just because we're good. We don't automatically lose because we're bad. The same fate befalls us all, and all, both the good and the bad, is chasing after the wind. Both the good and the bad are vapor. They're vanity. It's utter meaninglessness. Now I'm done.
That's our full wisdom lesson from Ecclesiastes. Now we can cue the discipline of silence slide. It really leaves you hurting. And I am just kidding. But I want to try to make this point. I hope what you're seeing is happening here. Solomon is waxing poetic about how fleeting life is. We are here today and gone tomorrow. In the vast scope of the universe and of life, there's not a lot of reason to think that we matter all that much. Let me give you one more illustration. I attended a science and faith lecture once when I was in seminary. World-renowned theologian and scientist John Halt he was a professor and he opened up with this brilliant illustration. He reminded us that the universe was 13.8 billion years old. If you were to publish an encyclopedic history of the universe and each page of the encyclopedias represented one million years, you would have to have 13,800 pages which you could bound into 46 or 30 different books of 460 pages. Hold that thought. Imagine 30 encyclopedias, three sets of 10 sitting on the stage. Every book, 460 pages. Every page represents a million years. Dr. Halt said, if the history of the universe were written down, you would find dinosaurs in book 30, page 208. You would find Pangaea in book 30, page 260. Our sun was formed 4,600 pages ago, which is in book 20. Humans do not enter into the story of the universe until the last book on the last page of the last paragraph of the last line. But sure, what you got going on in your world is super important. <laughs> and yet that's the dichotomy that we need to see. Our world, as a matter of fact, is super important. And I think Solomon knows this. In Ecclesiastes 2.24, he pivots. There is nothing better for mortals than to eat and drink and find joy, enjoyment in their toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. Now, I hope you feel the tug of war here. I hope you can see this literary pivot the great teacher, King Solomon, is wrestling with the fact that wisdom does not dispel or dismiss sorrow. There is no amount of wisdom that can take the pain of your life away. There's no amount of wisdom that can stop you from dying. It doesn't matter what life you live or choices you make, you will die and so will they. And all of this is going to come to an end. So what do we do? What silver lining exists in the midst of this madness? Solomon answers, you search for, you hold on to, you live and you allow things to acquire deep meaning and joy. You find as much joy in this life in the time that you have and you hold it for as long as you can. Ecclesiastes 3.12. I know there is nothing better for them than to be happy, to enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it is God's gift that all should eat and drink and take pleasure in their toil. So yes, life is vapor, so enjoy it while you have it. Yes, life is terribly unfair. So you better find and hold on to joy where you can. Yes, life is going to break your heart. So anchor down and hold those things close that bring your life joy. Joy is God's gift in the face of madness. Joy is God's antidote for our feelings of meaninglessness. And this may be the wisest thing we can hold in all of the Old Testament. Solomon knows life is going to break your heart. 
Your efforts feel like vapor. So seek joy. Find what you love in the time that you have and lean into it. Seek it. Give yourself to that world because you are here for a short time. But you can find pleasure. You can find the time. You can find things in your life that come from the hand of God. We will all die, but we're not dead yet. So eat, drink, and allow yourself to take pleasure in your work because the antidote to deep suffering is deep joy. And this is perhaps the truest truth that we can hold in wisdom literature, that deep wisdom It attaches itself, it sees, it knows how to appreciate and to find in our world meaning and joy. Deep joy can hold the tension between sorrow and hope. It can allow you to have meaning in a world that says it's meaningless. So what is it that you deeply enjoy? Hold on to it. Trust it. Because that's the avenue where God speaks wisdom to you. The thing that brings you pleasure. The food that you delight in. The toil that makes your work feel not like work. Those are the conduits of grace that channel for us the wisdom of the Lord. What we eat and drink and the work we pour ourselves into and the people that we do it with, that gives us meaning and it helps us find deep joy. Ecclesiastes tells us you can live the rest of your life and feel like it was worth nothing. But divine wisdom can be yours and tell you that you're worth a heck of a lot if you lean into it. Give yourself to the wisdom of the Lord and find meaning. When you find it, you find God because our joy is where God is for us. And when you find God, you find the meaning of your life. 